Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm feeling jazzy. So, um, <laughs> jazz hands. My name is Chris Ferry, and this, of course, is my co host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we're both very excited to be talking to you about the brand spanking new Ray Fimes, Ray Fines and Anna, Anna Taylor Joy film, The Menu. Is that gonna fit everyone? Yeah, easily. Twelve customers total. How do they turn a profit? Twelve fifty a head. That's how. What are we eating? A Rolex? It's one of his classics. You have to try the mouse feel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthful. Tonight will be madness. Welcome. We'll endeavor to make your evening as pleasant as possible. Welcome to Hawthorne. Here we are family. Yes, sir! We harvest, we ferment, we gel. They gel? We gel. He's not just a chef, he's a storyteller. The game is trying to guess what the overarching theme of the entire meal is going to be. You won't know till the end. Who are you? I am Margo. Why do you care? I have to know if you're with us or with them. This menu. The pictures, they're of us. This guest list. How do they get these? It's not good. This entire evening. Jesus Christ. This is just theater, it's stagecraft. We're leaving, now. Has been painstakingly planned. This is real, isn't it? What the hell is going on? We now offer you a 45 second head start. Okay, 45 seconds starts now. This is what you're paying for. Get out of my way. It's all part of the menu. It's okay. No, we're gonna die today. Yes, we are. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. You told them it was my birthday? Seemed funny about three hours ago. Do you have a synopsis for us, Monsieur? I do. Uh, so this is a, a 2022 film, and it was directed by Mark Mylod, M-Y-L-O-D. I'm not familiar with him, but Adam Adam McKay was a producer on that. This and Will Ferrell. Interesting. I did not know either of those things. Um, and it stars. Ray Fiennes, Anya Taylor-Joy, Nicholas Holt, uh, Judith Light, some other people. And the synopsis is a couple, Anya Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt, travels to a coastal island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef, Ray Fiennes, has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. And um, so we will say, since this is a pretty new film, we'll spoil this. It'd be kind of tough to talk about this without spoiling, but we spoil all the movies that we talk about on this show uh it is available now on hbo max so if you have hbo max you can watch it there without paying anything extra but it's on you know you can rent it other places and everything so um you watched this what a couple of weeks ago i think and i just watched it yesterday but what did you think i I watched it a couple of weeks ago but i watched it again last night just Ah, to freshen it freshen it back up i skipped through a few bits um Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just reiterate on the spoiler thing. Um, If you're interested in seeing this movie, I recommend you kind of go into it not knowing what happens. I think think that's a more active way to watch this movie. So I had seen the trailer, but I, other than that, I didn't know anything about what takes place in the movie. So, which I think is a good good way to go into it if you want to be surprised. Some movies, you know, can be quote unquote spoiled and it doesn't take away from your enjoyment of the film. This is one I think that having it spoiled for you changes how you go into watching it. I mean, you go into watching it, even if you've seen the trailer, knowing something's up, Mm -hmm. but we're going to ruin it. Yeah. Okay. I think we've made our point. So let's ruin it. What did I think? I, I, I thought that it looks delicious. 
Mm -hmm. It really is sumptuously shot. I'm going to use a lot of food metaphors. I was going to, sumptuous is, you took the word right out of my mouth. That was the word um, I was. You know, and used. it's a send up of this kind of very couture cuisine, very top level dining experience where the chef is a celebrity. And beyond that is even like a secretive celebrity. Mm -hmm. I think they say at some point in the film that it's like 1250 ahead to attend this and there's only 10 diners an evening or something like that and so it is it's a send up of the of the very elite of the very elite it's on a private island ray finds is this chef it the, the 10 people that are there or there's a the sort of um over the hill movie star um there's clearly a sort of, um, you know, boomer age. I assume he's in finance or something or ex-politician and his wife. There's three young uh, finance guys who turn out to work for the guy who sort of. Um, the angel investor. Of the... Invested in this whole thing. Um, and there's a the sort of famous restaurant critic that gave this guy his start and her magazine, the guy from the magazine, that's her friend slash, you know, rep publisher, et cetera. And, uh, Anna Taylor joy, we follow, we walk in with Anna Taylor joy. Who's the date of this young guy. What's his face. You probably Nicholas Holt, Nicholas Holt, whom I recognize from more and more things, but from, um, X-Men. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. The sort of young generation of X-Men. Mm -hmm. um, B was Beast, right? Yeah. Um, everybody does a good job. I think the acting is all competent. Um, the script is playful. I think the first time I watched it, I was a little put off by how strong it came on, how heavy handed it felt to me. Um, Watching it a second time, that didn't bother me. Watching it a second time and having kind of having my palate sort of been adjusted to it, um, I appreciated a lot of the subtle stuff. Um, knowing what happens, all of the little comments that at first just felt aggressive, like, wow, that, you know, the restaurant staff wouldn't be this. I mean, it was borderline hostile. Mm -hmm. You're like, I mean, I understand they're exclusive, but come on. But then once you know what happens, you're kind of like, oh, okay, this is all just really foreshadowing of something you don't know yet. Um, You know, there's comedy in it. There's heavy-handed satire. There is, you know, tones of class and the service industry and, you know, what what people deserve and what eating is. And... um. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was an enjoyable watch. I really liked Ray Fiennes in this role. It's a weird role for him. And Anna Taylor-Joy is a favorite. I like her. I think she deserves all the work she's getting. Um, this is not my favorite thing I've seen her in. I don't think this asks anything particularly deep of her. No. She hits all the emotional notes. I mean, she does her job as an actor and I think she's compelling on screen just by who she is. And I'm not saying she phoned it in. I just don't think that as a role, this is one of the ones that she plumbed particularly deeply. Mm -hmm. It feels like she was able to show up having done her work and sail right through it. And okay. Ray finds actually, they, they, he takes his time and there's a number of times when, you know, we see him sort of taking in what's happening in front of him and processing that and seeing tumblers turn and and watching his mind work. And I really enjoyed that in his performance because mm -hmm. um, it turns out that he is a character that is... Um, He's so tightly strung that he's reached his, his breaking point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the spoiler right there without getting into the gory details. Um, so what did you think? Yeah. So one thing I want to preface, well, not really preface, but we're having some crazy wind here. I don't know if you could hear any of that or not, but it, I'm not at, hearing at it. First, at first, I thought it was an airplane flying overhead, which is just wind. So it's uh, our 
uh, as an aside, our insane weather here, we're supposed to have thunderstorms tonight and then it's supposed to turn to snow, right. so, which is cl- completely logical, you know? It, yeah. So um, I would liken this to, so the twilight zone is probably my favorite show ever. And this is kind of like a feature length twilight zone episode. Um, you mentioned satire and kind of dark comedy. I almost think of this more as, as like a dark fantasy. You know, this is a, this is definitely a film where I think people who have trouble with suspension of disbelief would maybe have some difficulties with this one. Uh, because this is one of these movies where like real people don't act the way the, you know, the characters doing this. And and from a satirical standpoint, basically you have a bunch of entitled, pretentious, snotty, rich people, which I don't know if that's a, we froze for a second. You were saying snotty, rich people. Yeah. So in terms of a satire, um, you know, it's, it's snotty, pretentious, entitled rich people. And I think everybody, uh, a send up of snotty entitled rich people. I think everybody that doesn't fit in that category probably doesn't like that group of people. You know what I mean? So, so I, I almost looked at this more as of a fantasy of like, Oh, um, and it's not even when you're so basically what, okay, I think we're, I'm going to have to put the spoiler alert in now and kind of talk about what happens. So these people, you know, are there and they're, they're all kind of various states of bad. And, uh, Ray Fiennes has gotten to where he has no more joy in cooking anymore. And he is going, he announces that he is going to kill all the, the diners. And then also he has, he and all of his staff live on this Island together and they're all going to die as well. Um, and so, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought as far as where I was going with this, but, um, so I guess where I would say it's a dark fantasy is, is it's like you, you don't really feel bad for these people. I mean, I don't know necessarily that you're thinking like, oh, I, I, I texted you early on. And as you had said, you know, you felt kind of, this was a little too on the nose or whatever, because the people are terrible. Yeah. And you do not, you basically don't like anybody except Anya Taylor Joy. And in a strange way, kind of Ray Fines, even though yeah. he's a psycho. Um, so I texted you early on and I was like, okay, I'm ready for these people to start dying because they're really annoying. And they get maybe slightly more fleshed out as as it goes along, but they're still pretty cartoonish, you know, bad people. Yeah, the, um, the film does an interesting thing because it sort of it starts them off as despicable. And we mm-hmm. really dislike Anna Taylor Joy's boyfriend, who we're seeing the most of. We're kind of with the two of them as they walk. Well, in. let me can I stop you there for yeah. just a second? Because initially I he was kind of likable, I felt, because it was like, well, he seems like a nice guy. But he's also very pretentious because he's so into this, you know, he's just so into the chef and the cook. And it's like, oh, I hope he likes me, you know. And so he gets to be, but you're you're still just kind of like, this guy's just kind of a nerd about food. And they give us a few minutes when he's charming with her. Exactly. We we show up, they're checking people in. It turns out that they're they don't have her name. They're expecting someone else. Right. And he was like, oh, oh, um, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, she couldn't, she canceled. She broke up with me basically. And um, I've brought her. And there's a little bit of a mystery with that because you think, okay, Anya Taylor joy is his, is his new girlfriend, you know, and he seems very nice about that. And, but then as it goes along, you find out that she's a prostitute, I guess. Yeah. She's an Um, escort. She's an escort. And then you but that's it, a problem kind of, that's a problem because it turns out that this whole thing has been very carefully planned and vetted based on who the expected guests are so that's correct. a wrench 
that we learn from Ray Fiennes, I mean, we figure this out eventually, but it, we we learn that it's a problem almost immediately because it's like, well, we're going to kill everybody here, right? And this is an innocent, we don't even know who this person is. So now mm-hmm. there's collateral damage. And we also discover that this, this kid has known about it. Mm-hmm. And he's yeah. like, and so you invited her knowing that she was going to die, right? Yeah. And so it does peel that onion. Like, wow, this guy is a real, <laughs> pardon my French, but he's a real piece of shit. <laughs> well, yeah. And the and it's interesting, like you said, is you're kind of peeling back the onion. So the other people, they're all bad. But, you know, and some of them, like, for example, the one uh, John Leguizamo plays is kind of washed up actor. And he's really, really cocky early on. And you're just like, oh, this guy's a jerk. But then he gets a little more human. You know, it's it's uh, but Nicholas Holt, it's exactly the opposite where he starts out, like I say, seeming like a nice guy. And then you find out, oh, he's as psycho as what Ray Fine is, because there's a scene where uh, uh, the first person who dies is one of the uh, staff comes out. He's the sous chef. He's the sous chef, right. And Ray Fine says, you know, his uh, his goal is basically he wants to have Ray Fine's job, but he says, you know, he doesn't have the talent to ever do that. And um, long story short, the guy shoots himself in, in the mouth, you know, drops dead. And the other people are screaming and everything. And Nicholas Holt is completely unfazed. So you're just like, oh, this guy is a complete sociopath, you know, or or psych or psycho. Um, so it's interesting what they do with that. But really, you, I guess maybe one, would a little bit be one, maybe a weakness of the film is that Anya Taylor Joy is the only truly likable person in the whole thing. And so, you know, she's going to be okay. She's going to get out of it somehow. And and it's interesting what they do, you know, as, as far as, as getting her out of it. But um, with Anya Taylor joy, I texted you and I said, she is, you know, she's beautiful, but she, she's almost like otherworldly. It, it made me think of the first time I ever went to Los Angeles we were in LAX. I mean, we'd just gotten off the plane. We're in LAX. We're walking along. And there was a woman in front of us who I'm sure was a model or an actress or, you know, somebody's, some actor's girlfriend or something like that. And it wasn't necessarily that you would look at this woman and just say, oh my God, what a gorgeous woman. But she was probably six feet tall, really slim, but curvy. And it was just like, I've never seen a woman who looked like this before. You know what I mean? It's like, it's almost like I'm looking at somebody from another planet. And that's what Anya Taylor-Joy is kind of like to me. It's just like she, you know, you just kind of can't take your eyes off her. And like you said, even though this isn't a, you know, she's doing fine with the material. It's not an amazing performance or anything. But but I think her likability is what takes you through this movie because you're rooting for her you know just like oh she's you know i hope she makes it out you know yeah they do give you at the end they give you a scene between ray fines and anna taylor joy is it anna or anya it's it's a n y a so i think it's anya yeah you get the scene between them that you're hoping for we get we get three or possibly four short scenes with them throughout the movie but but at the very end we get this satisfying scene that I feel like not that the whole movie needs an excuse to watch it, but it, to me, it kind of lets you off of the hook Mm -hmm. um, emotionally because you want her to get away and you want him to let her get away and you want him to find joy. You know, we, my wife and I watch these cooking shows and we watch them because we think it's fascinating to watch people who are food professionals, these master chefs, just the way they handle the food. For you know, people talk about it like food porn. Yeah, exactly. The, the quality of the ingredients they're working with is is gorgeous, right? They'll have a piece of salmon, and that salmon looks like no salmon you've ever seen. It's gorgeous salmon, right? And the way that they cut it, 
and the way that they're careful with it and the knife, the way it splits the protein and they handle it. And it, it is, you know, this, this is a, this is a cult really. I mean, the, the chefs that work for him are ready to die for him Mm -hmm. and the diners that come are willing to spend crazy amounts of money. And there's layers to that. Like there's layers to why they spend the money, but this is really supposed to be the temple of cuisine. And I think the film shows us the ways in which that has become perverse in some ways, Mm -hmm. many ways, but at its core is supposed to be this love of cooking and serving and eating and enjoying together. And Mm -hmm. the whole film is this, is how twisted and perverse that's kind of become and infused with money and how dirty that makes it feel. Um, But by the end, she says, uh, you know, when there's issues of service, like she's always saying, you, what are you talking about? What do you care what he thinks about you? You're paying a lot of money for this man to make you dinner, right? Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. you're he, it's a service industry. You're paying him to feed you food that you're supposed to enjoy. And if you want to send it back, that's your right. Like you're the customer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, at the end, she stands up and her gambit to get out of there is, I don't I don't like the food that you've made me and I'm still hungry and I'm not satisfied and I'm the customer. And that kind of knocks him out of his groove. I think in some ways he has wanted her not to be a part of this because he has- She wasn't on the list. Predetermined she... that she's someone that deserves to die. And they've already sort of started to form a connection where- he understands that she's an escort. And did you used to did you used to enjoy what you did in your version of the service industry? And she said, Yeah, he says we're we're both in the service industry. I, I, you know, I did once upon a time. Right. This was a choice that I made because I took pleasure from it mm-hmm. in the ways that I took pleasure from it. He doesn't judge her, right? And she has seen in his private quarters where she snuck into at one point. There's a picture of him, like employee of the year, his first job when he's basically a kid and he's making hamburgers. Yeah. And he's just got this beautific grin splitting his face as he's making these burgers. And she says, I want a cheeseburger. And he said, I can make you a cheeseburger. And she says, not one of the, not none of this deconstructive junk, right? I want a, I want a real honest to God cheeseburger. And he's like, I'll make you a cheeseburger a traditional cheeseburger. I'll make you a cheeseburger that, that, you know, will make you feel like it's the first cheeseburger you ever ate. You know, the cheap kind that your mom bought you the first time. And the way they shoot that, man, you're just like, it's beautiful. I was salivating. I I really, I was, it was late at night last night and I had smoked some and I watching him make that, he makes her a double cheeseburger and he smashes the patties down and he puts yeah. he puts some sliced onion on the grill and then he flips it over onto the onion and he melts the they talk about the cheese. She wants with American cheese and he says, Well, American cheese is the best cheese to use for a cheeseburger because it doesn't mm-hmm. split when it melts. Yeah. You know? And he, it's sesame seed bun and he makes it for her, and it's this huge, perfect, gorgeous, sloppy, greasy cheeseburger. And she says, with fries. And he goes, is the fryer still on? And the guy goes, yeah, chef. And he goes, crinkle cut or julienne. (laughs) So he makes her (laughs) a cheeseburger and fries. And she takes one bite of it and chews it and really enjoys it. Going, "Mm, mmm, mmm. And swallows and she goes, now that is a cheeseburger. And the whole thing is so viscerally satisfying. He's making it. He's not grinning like he did in the picture, but you actually see him smiling in a genuine way. Like, man, it's been too long since I just made, like, I can make the best cheeseburger in the world and I'm making it, you know? And then she eats it and she goes, you know, but I think my eyes were bigger than my stomach. And he goes, well, that's perfectly all right. And she goes, can I get the rest to go? Which is a huge taboo. You know, you don't go to a nice restaurant and ask for it to go. They're like, no, you can't have it to go. But yeah. so he sits and stares at her for a long time. And, and this is one of those moments where a lot's going through his mind. And I think he realizes this is an opportunity to 
to be the server, you know, the customer's always right, and to let her go. Right. There's no need for her. So what? So what if she is, I think at first it's like, okay, well, nobody gets out of here alive, but why? They're all going to go, she can't stop it. She'll tell the authorities it won't matter. Yeah. So he, he goes and he wraps it up and he hands it to her and he says one cheeseburger to go. And he nods at his goons at the door who let her leave. And she does. She goes and she hot wires the boat and she takes the boat out and she turns the engines off. And then she sits and she takes out her cheeseburger. And, and then in the background, the place goes up in flames. And we do get to be inside. The story continues inside. Mm-hmm. But to me, that cheeseburger scene is that's is the satisfying button on the whole movie that 100%. I have been wanting the whole movie. hundred percent. Yeah. Literally. While I was watching that scene, and it's funny that you used the word satisfying because I was sitting there thinking, this is probably the most satisfying scene of anything that I saw that came out in 2022. It's just, the, I was just grinning. She just takes a big bite of, and she takes the uh, the menu and wipes her mouth with it. Yep. She folds it up and wipes her mouth with the menu. Right. That was just... I just thought that was fantastic. Right. And I think, so if you say, well, maybe this movie's too heavy handed or maybe it's miscalibrated, blah, 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 blah. I, I refer you to that scene and I say, well, those were choices then that these filmmakers made because anybody who can end the movie with that scene knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe so then, and I watched it a second time and I got more out of it the second time. And I don't think the first time I watched it, I thought this movie ran that deep. I thought it was just kind of like, oh, okay, we're going to make fun of rich people. And I don't disagree, but it's like, yeah, it's not fun watching despicable people. And sure, you let them humanize a little bit, but I didn't, it wasn't until I went back around and watched it a second time that I picked up some subtle stuff. And I thought, so maybe the critique is, if you're going to put out something on HBO streaming, you know, maybe. Well, this this was in theaters. Oh, was this, it? Yeah, yeah. It played in theaters. It made. Uh, I looked here. It it brought in. Uh, it came out in November, and it did thirty eight million dollars. I don't know what the budget was, but but it did thirty eight million in the theater. Anyway, I I think what I'm saying is maybe the critique the critique is the challenge of making. Um, a feature film that is you're hoping is going to make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars is that you, I don't know that you can expect audiences to come see it multiple times. Now, if you're making Avatar 2, mm -hmm. which is really the consummate blockbuster, which I still haven't seen, by the way, but I mean, it's going to make billions of dollars. You know, I think you were at 2 billion with it's already like the number seven movie of all time. Yeah. And worldwide. I'm sure it's spectacular. I'm sure if I go and see it in the big thing with the 3d glasses, it's going to be, you know, James Cameron's next wild ride. I walked out of the first one when I saw it in theaters and I said, Wow. Just wow. Now, how well that stands up and how much it changes your life, I don't know. This isn't that kind of a movie, right? I mean, I think that's more like a, that's more like a roller coaster ride at a theme park. You, you People are going to want to take the ride again. And with a movie like this, that's ultimately it's a thinker. It's a thriller. It's a thinker. It's 80 or 90% probably one location. You yeah. Know? They're in this, we're in this dining room in the kitchen in the back for the vast majority of the film. Like the cuisine in the film, this this movie is very carefully crafted. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I I you know I I thought watching it a second time was was I'm glad that I watched it a second time. I liked it better the second time I saw it. Um the three finance guys the first time around really drove me crazy <laughs> they, they're I mean, pretty bad they, and, but they're great performances they're so smug yeah. and they're so rich and they're so entitled and they're so unused to anybody saying no to them that they i mean these are not the kind of guys that'll get up and strike you 
But the implication is you're going to do what we want because we pulled the strings and we own everything and we're the boss. And so when they get told flat to their face, no, they can't process it. And I thought that was more entertaining the second time around than it was the first. Because I still the first time around didn't realize that the the cooks, the, the staff here are really holding all the cards. Mm-hmm. One other thing I wanted to talk to you about is he has a speech about two thirds of the way through when they sort of, when the penny drops that he's not going to let them leave, that he's going to kill them all that he says. And you know, you, you look, look at yourselves. Like you, you've really, you know, I'm right. And you know, you deserve this. And deep down, this is what you want. You, none of you have tried particularly hard to get out of here. Right. Yeah. I mean, they haven't all. Yeah. He says you could have you could have overpowered us, probably something like that. You know, there are more of the staff, though they didn't even try. So there's yeah. there's maybe there's um, it's not five parties of two. Right. It's there's maybe 12 people in there, maybe 15 people in there, something like that. His mother is in there as, as well, who's drunk all through it and. But there's probably 20 wait staff and there's, you know, another 10 goons. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if it came down to it, it's not a sure thing, but they don't even really no, but There's not even an attempted uprising. They all just mm-hmm. kind of accept it. And by the end, we even see people say one woman even says, thank you. You know, so it's it's what did you think of that, of how it sort of brought these people around and the implication that what these incredibly entitled people want is release. Like they don't like being at the very cream of this class where there's nothing left. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see that the, um, I think where it, it kind of plays into also that thing that I was saying of where it's kind of a, you know, where it gets into the dark comedy or satire or that kind of a thing where they don't really act like real people. Like, for example, there's one scene where they take all of them outside. They say, we're going to go outside for this next portion. And they tell all of the men that they have 45 seconds. They're going to start a 45 second, you know, counter and they can take off, you know, try to get away. Right. And, so, and all of the men run away. You you think initially when you still think maybe he's kind of a decent guy, Nicholas Holt is going to maybe stick around with her and he takes off too. And then the women just all go inside and start eating and, you know, drinking their, the there's wine or champagne or whatever and drinking it. And I just thought, this is not a way that real people would, you know, they would be crying or, or, you know. Uh, up, they don't even really se- seem upset that the that the men all took off. It's just kind of like, well, I guess we'll drink this wine, you know, and eat this food. So, I mean, that's a good point that you that you make. I hadn't really thought of it that way. That they just kind of want an out. You know, it's it's funny with the food. He, it's kind of like he's rubbing their nose in it because he does. Like for example, there's one Porsche part where. He comes out and he says that uh, that bread was for peasants because it's the most simple thing. You know, it's it's just flour and water. And he said, but you're not poor, so you don't get bread. So instead, he just gives them, you know, sort of these different sauces and things, maybe butter. And I don't know what the other ones. So you get all the things that would, you know, go on bread. And they're really you know, unhappy Furious. about this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I think there's an interesting thing where they, and I'm getting us a little bit off of your question that you said, but you know, we've had the kind of joke forever of, uh, Oh, you know, you go to a restaurant in New York city or San Francisco and, you know, you're just going to get a time, you're going to get a pea on a plate, you know, surrounded by a sauce or something. And so, it's interesting how in the end she says, I just want a cheeseburger. It's kind of the most American of basic foods. And, you know, none of the people, they don't, they're not happy with any of the food. Um, 
And so I, you know, I think that's kind of a little funny thing that they're playing with there, that it's just like, does anybody really like this stuff? Wouldn't you rather have a cheeseburger? But um, yeah, well, I but, hadn't really thought of of the idea that maybe they don't, they don't really care if they die. Well, um, but that, not just that, that they want to die, that they crave it, because mm -hmm. he also says, you know, he, in the only, in the speech where he sort of explains why he's doing this. He's like, you know, I, I have climbed in this profession to the very pinnacle. We, I, we got, I got my own private island for this restaurant. And right, I literally, I have everything I possibly, I could make you anything, right? She says, well, what do you got? And he says, I, I, we have everything. I can make you anything you want. Um, and he said, but I, but I realized uh, now... This is all that I do, right? It, it consumes all of every day. This is all that I do. And now I'm only serving a clientele that I can never make happy. Like right. th it's never good enough. This is literally the best. I am the best at this. And you people come here because it's the best of the best, but it's never enough for you. You're never satisfied by it. And I feel like, that's what it's kind of underlining is you make all of the money and you win all of the awards and you achieve everything that's possible and it doesn't make you happy, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we are in pursuit of all this stuff because we think when we win, we'll be satisfied. But what really ends up being satisfying is that cheeseburger, yeah. right? The comfort food, the transaction of I'm hungry, somebody makes me the best you know, cheeseburger they can make me. And it, and it really is when she bites it, the nice acting she does is the promise is I'm going to make you a cheeseburger that takes you back to the first cheeseburger you ever ate. And it appears to do that. Like mm -hmm. she goes on, she eats the food and there's this kind of journey she goes on as she experiences it. And wow. That is that's the cheeseburger, man, you mm -hmm. know, but ultimately it's just a cheeseburger, right? So she'll take the rest of it later. She'll eat it. She'll consume it. It's just food, right? But it is the, it's the interaction between the two of them in the moment on which all of this, this whole menu and this whole experience seems to be predicated, but it has gotten so, you know, eaten its own tail that it, doesn't mean anything to any of them anymore. The critic will never, you know, is picking apart everything that's, you know, yeah. only finding fault with it. The the older couple that's there, that it turns out that the man has has hired uh, Anya, Taylor, Anya Joy. Taylor Joy at one point, and that's I think that's you know supposed to be. It's nothing more than a subplot, really. It doesn't. It just goes to illustrate how kind of messed up he is. And... It's a little creepy because, like, they. It's like apparently she looks like his daughter, right? And so that, that's really yeah. gross. Yeah. yeah. So, but, um, but the two of them have been there so many times that they don't want. They just want to skip the tour because they're like regulars. But they're, it's not like they're enjoying their meal or and their marriage asks, or their life. They're just. And he, he says. How many, you know, you're, you're regulars. How many times have you been here? And I think one of them says six and one says seven. He says 11 times. <laughs> and he says, and what was your favorite meal that, that you know, since you've been, that. and they can't name anything. Right. And, you know, and so he's like, coming there because that's the top of the, that's the peak. Right. Yeah. And we're the richest. So we dine in the mountaintop, but they don't, they're not it, doing the experience and he's not anymore either. So in some ways by, asking for a cheeseburger and asking for it to go and taking him back to that basic service industry stuff. She's giving him something, right? She's giving him the, the experience of being that employee of the month and making the best cheeseburger in the biz. And it's the first know, time that anybody's been appreciative probably of anything for a long time, you know, that he's done and reminding him how he got started in doing this in the first place. Yeah. Um, and all of that, all of that goes into the satisfaction of that scene. Um, the other thing the movie does that I wanted to talk to you about is there's sort of super titles mm -hmm. that you would you see come up on the screen. It's like, you know, um, as though we're seeing the menu come up on the screen. It's like, you know, 
amuse bouche, you know, whatever scallops harvested locally from whatever. And, mm-hmm. um, and those get tongue in cheek as it goes at the end, it says, you know, cheeseburger, just a well-made cheeseburger, you know? Mm-hmm. And, some of them were more playful than others. What did you think of that trope throughout the movie? Because it's more of a comic conceit. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely laughed at a couple of those, especially the one at the end with the, with, with the cheeseburger. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was neat the way they did that. And they would show, you know, scenes of the ocean and, you know, when they... And that was shot yeah. really well as yeah. well. Yeah, I thought that was a neat little yeah. conceit, you know. Um. You know, it's one of those things that I was kind of hot and cold on both times I saw it. And I think sometimes it's really funny and sometimes it felt pretentious. But I mean, again, I think that's all kind of by design. I think they looked at it and they made choices. Mm -hmm. You can't really ask for more than that when you're watching a movie. No, no. I like Ray Fiennes. You know, I you see him in the James Bond films and he's sort of a hard ass and uh, he's sometimes villainous and... We watched him in Strange Days when he's young. You don't get to usually see him as the kind of um, handsome male lead. He's kind of the intimidating boss. Yeah. And he's the intimidating boss here, too. Although, once we learn he's a man on the day, you know, this is the evening he's basically committing suicide um, and taking everybody with him. A mass, you know, mass suicide and mass murder. There's a sadness that I saw more in the second time around knowing what was happening that I appreciated more, where it's this kind of um, existential grief that he's carrying with him. And the hostility towards the diners is very real and very specific. Like, he knows exactly. I did, there's So the actor, the Legazamo as plays an actor. And the only reason he's going to kill him is he didn't like this movie. Like he's like, (laughs) you represent, you represent the artist that is kind of given is stop doing art and just started phoning it in and doing this crap. And I get, I got one day off a week and I went to go see your movie and it was just so depressing to watch you, you know, phone it in through this movie. And and like, it's almost like, that's fair. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But Legazamo's, it turns out Legazamo's mistress and also his sort of personal assistant and um, the woman who's the young woman who's there with him and who I thought was charming in the movie. Yeah, she she's not necessarily like she's an evil person. The only I guess what's bad just about titled. Is, yeah, I mean, he's just and, a social climber and work in the system. Yeah, yeah. But he goes, you know, she's like, why? Why do I have to die? And he's like. Where did you go to college? He said, Brown. And he said, student loans. And she said, no. And he said, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, you're dying. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just, just kind of class warfare. Like, no, I'm sick of it. You know, yeah. so there's a dash of that too. And it's played for a laugh, but I actually really liked that character. I didn't, Of the despicable characters, that was more, I'm like, okay, so you're including those people that were born lucky and just kind of worked the system, but didn't necessarily ruin other people's lives in the way that some of the people in the room had. You know, some of the people in the room were painted as people who lied and cheated and stealed and backstabbed and, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the indication that she had done any of those things. But no, I mean, she was, she was definitely probably the best of them. The, the three dudes who I didn't in, until they explicitly said they were finance guys, I thought they were they were going to be some kind of influencers. I thought they were going to be like oh. Instagram, Instagram guys or something like that. You know, I, um, I clocked them right off the bat as okay. those because you know living in New York, you see those downtown, those Wall Street finance guys and yeah. their leather shoes with no socks and their bro attitude and. And one of the that right away, one of the I mean, it's funny, I guess, but the the angel investor guy um, and those and those guys continually name drop him. I forget what his name is, but if there's anything, you know, that they're unhappy about, it's like, you know, so we know so and so, you know, 
he, we work with him, you know, and I think there's one point where somebody says, he's your boss. You know, they're like, well, we work with him. Well, he's your boss, right. but they work for him and they yeah. kill him in the movie. Yeah. They and they literally, in. literally, you know, to, to put a fine point of him being an angel investor, they literally have him out above the ocean with big angel wings on and then they just lower him down <laughs> into the you know and i think that you know that was almost like a thing where they could just, just say like we can kill anybody you know uh even this guy that you think you know can... right he we're untouchable because of our association with the guy who paid for all this yeah. so some bread now please right and they're like right um no <laughs> yeah <laughs> just like, so how I, dare I really... you you realize you know you realize we're gonna tell him right and they're like you can tell him whatever you want because we're going to kill him as part of the TV. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like you said, the assistant of John Leguizamo didn't seem like that unbearable of a person, you know? And the actor does a great job and she's charming and funny. It's mostly light and it's mostly comic relief. And John Leguizamo um, is also, you know, he doesn't have a lot of heavy lifting to do in this. He's playing, a, you know like a has been a lister or b lister mm -hmm. popular you know you think he's maybe not not as dumb as steven seagal but you know not brad pitt it was just yeah somebody that everybody would have saw all of his movies when he was a kid and aged What's... out of him and now is doing talking about doing a reality tv show where he's well just... and somebody asks what he's doing now and he's like well i'm i'm kind of in my presenter phase now yeah, right you know in my career yeah <laughs> yeah so, uh, and he was even talking to the young woman about, uh, they're like trying to set up like a cooking show for him or like a, yeah, a food worry. travel show. And he's yeah. just like, well, I'll go to this place and I'll take a bite of this food and then I'll go to South Africa and I'll take a bite of, you know, and right. Uh, we'll go to the local funny. cheese place. I'll fake an orgasm. And then, yeah. you know, that's it. I'll put on the local shirt. <laughs> she's like, and that's your pitch. And he's like, yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's a pitch <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and then you think about it and you go, yeah, I mean, that's the pitch. I mean, there's nothing, they're not selling anything else. They're selling face recognition and beautiful settings and somebody being like, oh man, this pizza is the best. Yeah. <laughs> but I think with her, you know, I think they're just, I just took it as they're just presenting like everybody, this is everybody in Hollywood, you know, they're just trying to, you know, get a better gig, you know, and move their way up, you know. Um, so, Yeah. And it comes out that she has been stealing. She confesses. She's like, I've been stealing money from you. And he's like, I know. Yeah. And she's like, I know, you know. So I think it's just it's it's the relationship of these older people that have quit trying to do anything but deliver the expected. And these younger people that kind of hitch their wagon to that, whether they're crawling in bed with them or they're helping them commit financial crimes or whatever it is that they just want to become the next generation and fill those people's shoes when they finally age out of it. Right. And it's all, you know, and she's having an affair with him and here's the keys to your apartment and here's the keys to your New York apartment and here's the key to the other New York apartment your wife doesn't know about. Right. And you're just supposed to be roll your eyes and be like, gross. Yeah. All of these people deserve to die. Yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, exactly. I think the movie makes you feel, does, I don't know, all the chefs, it seems like a shame that all the chefs are willing to, like, yeah, <laughs> die too. You know, and uh, the young guy is, he whispers, he, he makes him cook a meal and then it's terrible. He says, you're the, you're, you're the reason that, this is all ruined because you know all of the secrets and you own all the equipment, but you're not an artist. And so mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, please come cook. And then he, he's like, wow, it's really bad. And then he whispers in his ear and the guy goes and hangs himself. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't understand all of that completely. I didn't understand what's that what that's supposed to be shining a light on i mean this guy's clearly this young guy's clearly a zealot but are there i mean does that chime for you as a part of society that's like ruining culture i i don't i i almost took it like um again you know you have this 
this idea of making fun of this kind of cuisine that's been around forever. And I almost kind of took it almost like where people will, um, you know, talk about modern art and just like, Oh, anybody could just, you know, slap some paint on. And if you ever actually tried to do like abstract painting, it can just look like a big mess. And it, you know what I mean? Oh, I do. And, uh, I didn't kind of realize until um, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City a few years ago, and there's a modern section, and some of these paintings, just in general, but but even the modern ones are you know like twenty feet wide. And there's you're like, a Pollock. Oh, no, there's a yeah, Pollock, there's Pollock there. that landed that for me because I you know I didn't necessarily think that, but I'm like it's a bunch of dribbles, so like right. I mean, uh, you know, experts think it's amazing, so I'm sure it is, but I don't get it. And then you go and you see, you go to, and you see that Pollock and you go, wow, there's a, there's a lot going on in that. Like, yeah, no, a four-year-old probably couldn't do this. Like there is a method in this madness that keeps unfolding and it, it, it's art. It is capital A art. And you're like, wow. You know, but yeah. you do have to kind of experience it. I think even seeing a print of it doesn't land in the same way. No, no. And I almost kind of took that, you know, this that way that, you know, people may look down on this who who don't get it or whatever. And I'm not saying that there isn't some, you know, that some of this food isn't kind of a joke, but also he as presented in the movie, he is an artist and it's not like, Oh, just, this isn't something that just anybody can do. Even if there's somebody who knows a lot about it, you know, right, or, or right. thinks they know a lot about it. I, I think, I think that when you eat the food prepared by a really great chef, it is a remarkable experience. I've had the pleasure of eating a few like really high end meals. Mm hmm. And you're like, wow, like you take a bite and it goes places, right? It right. starts as one thing and the flavors unfold. It's like in Ratatouille where he's imagining all these like synesthesia kind of unfolding stuff. Uh, so it's not, it's not nothing, but mm -hmm. I think the idea of the bread course where it's like, so you get no bread is also a send up of how kind of, you know, thematic and in your head some of this stuff at the highest levels can get right or the wine guy serving the wine it's like oh he tells you about the year and the the winery and notes of pepper spice and a hint of regret <laughs> you know, and, just, and is that when the guy shoots himself about, and he's like serve yeah i love that line a hint of regret or something you know and there's just mm -hmm. but he's talking about the wine in ways that are like it's busy but never precocious yeah <laughs> wine <laughs> Uh, and I think that this movie does a good job of underlining how pretentious the whole thing can get at the very highest levels when you're going to pay $1,200 for yeah. a dinner. You're just like, what, what are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. What's your? But uh, so, so, so what do you think? Would you recommend it to our listeners? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I liked this more than I expected to not like it, I thought it was going to be a bad movie or anything, but I just, you know, I had seen the trailer and just kind of wasn't wowed by it. And I thought, yeah. ah, I don't know. I mean, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, I had an idea of where this was going, you know, when I saw the trailer, I, I wasn't sure if it was, you know, I thought he might be cooking the people and serving them to each other or something like that, which, it, you know, that's not what happens, but, um, but I, I felt like, you know, I was never quite sure what was going to happen. And like I say, it had, you know, it had very much that kind of Twilight Zone vibe to it or Black yeah. Mirror, you yeah. know. Um, and I, you know, I that's my kind of my jam. I love that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it, too. Yeah. I think I found it. I think I found it um, off putting the first viewing a little bit because I thought it was painted in very bold strokes mm -hmm. and because the, the clientele, you know, as you're getting into the movie, the clientele are so obnoxious and they're yeah. so dislikable. And, and 
they're doing that so that you don't feel bad for them when they're immolated at the end mm -hmm. in a giant a group s'more, right? He puts these sort of chocolate that was, caps Yeah, on I forgot and about the s'more, and that was great. And uh, this sort of, um, it's a sort of um, shoulder pads made out of uh, marshmallows, and then they sprinkle this they sort of flammable a, graham cracker stuff. They all put in. a chocolate hat on each yeah. other. Yeah. Um, the graham cracker spread all over the floor in this sort of flammable pattern, and he walks out into the middle of it holding a hot coal in his hands. He talks about chef's hands and how mm -hmm. you know he could carry a cast iron dish right out of the oven to the table, and it wouldn't. Chefs have a he puts a, he holds his hand over a flame at yeah. one point to show, and so he that. he picks up a hot coal and he goes walking out into the middle of it, and he makes his final speech, and then he drops it, and the whole thing goes up in flames, and everybody roasts, and then it does the super title of like dessert, you know, s'mores, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, graham cracker, chocolate marshmallow, yeah. restaurant staff, diners, everything, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I I I watched it a second time and liked it. I liked it the first time, but I had a lot to say about it. And I watched mm -hmm. it the second time, and I really I enjoyed it much more thoroughly the second time. Although I did skip a few scenes, sure. Um, but man, that cheeseburger scene made the whole movie. Oh yeah, that was great for me. Yeah, um, totally agree on that. I love that cheeseburger scene. And this is much more of. I mean, it's it's been categorized as horror i would say this is more of a thriller you know it's not there's it's a horror couple because there's a there's some suicide the guy kills himself and and yeah. and it does have that kind of like you can't escape my mother right. would not like this movie yeah yeah you know so... it's certainly there are horrific scenes and elements to it but this isn't even though there's you know i guess you could say there's a torture element to this but it's not like a torture because this isn't a saw or something like they're that, not allowed know? to leave right and i i mean i thought because it was sort of the trailer paints it as a kind of an ominous horror thing i thought too i'm like oh are they eating the diners mm -hmm. are they eating each other somebody gets up and goes to the restroom or whatever never comes back and then the dish is served and it turns out to be them and yeah and so um it isn't that it is and I think that's actually kind of a demerit. It's, I think that they, the people marketing it probably like, well, we, look, we got to sell this as horror because you, mm -hmm. you can't sell a movie that's really sort of straddles three genres. Um, yeah. You know, it is funny. It is upsetting a little bit in a horror way. And it's also satire, but it's not funny enough to sell as a comedy. No. And you can't really sit. Nobody goes to see a satire. You can't really market it that. Even if it's a Twilight, like Black Mirror is not all horror, but no. it gets marketed as you got to pick. And yeah. horror is kind of the one to sell. But I don't think it rises to that. I think you could have made this movie that. Yeah. Um, but I think if people, if you said, hey, horror fans, come see the new horror movie, they would be dissatisfied. They would come expecting more gore, yeah. cannibalism, something, something horrifying. And there isn't, there isn't. That really. said, though, I saw this on lots of horror end of the year lists. You know, the people had this, this high. So I definitely people who are into horror overall, you know, were into this. But this is a, despite the things that are happening, this is a, a fun movie. You know, I mean, if, yeah. if you have a pretty dark sense of humor, you know, yeah. if, you, if, uh, I think if you were gonna if you were gonna categorize it in horror, it would be in the sort of niche of the cult and the mm -hmm. they come to this guru of food and uh, they're not allowed to leave and it's all a, it's all a death pact. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but surprisingly funny and entertaining if it's that movie, you know. I yeah. think it's really more of a social commentary movie that has right. all of those elements in it. But yeah. I did enjoy it, so I would recommend it too. Yep. So two recommends, two thumbs up, four thumbs um, up. Great. Uh do, do we already decide what we're going to do for next time? We talked about I think it's 90 90 94 or 95 John Carpenter directed remake of Village of the Damned Village with of Christopher, the Damned. Christopher Reeve 
and Mark uh, Hamill, Mark Hamill, and Kirstie Kirstie Alley. Yeah. Um, which this is one that, so you've not seen, right? Correct. I, I have haven't seen the seen. original either, although yeah, I'm I haven't familiar, either. I haven't I'm either. familiar with the original. I haven't seen. Um, it. and it, it's one that I've always has always been in the back of my mind to watch because at the time everybody just said it's terrible, right. and I stayed away from it. Uh, even though I'm a big John Carpenter fan, I mean he's right. done you know Halloween and the Fog and sure. the Thing, you know, are among my favorite, and even things like They Live, you know. Um, but yeah, this is a John Carpenter that this is one of the only John Carpenter films that I've never seen. So, and the original um, is a science fiction horror classic. Yeah, it's the original is a British film, and it's um, from sixty. I mean, it's black some, and yeah, white. right around it's there, early. And yeah. if you watch the two trailers back to back, which I have done. Hmm. <laughs> the original looks way more interesting and yeah. I, you know i love i love these actors like christopher reeve and mark hamill and kirstie alley uh, like oh awesome you know and john carpenter but you watch the two trailers back to back and you're like well if i could only pick one of them to watch i'd want to watch the original one so yeah but we're not going to do that we're going to watch the carpenter remake great and uh it It'll be interesting to see, is it just bad? Is it so bad it's good? You know, right. is it uh, is it maybe an okay movie? I don't know. So I'm I'm curious because I've just always thought, oh, that's going to be terrible. You yeah. Know? So we'll, well we're going to we're going to see Chris and Chris talk movies at Gmail dot com. That's our handle. We're on the socials. Maybe you're watching us on YouTube. Maybe you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app. Either way, thank you so much. Like and subscribe. That's great for us. <laughs> great for us. It doesn't really make a difference, but we it's like it. For us. We like it. The YouTube um, channel is growing. Yeah. If you want to, um, you know, leave us a comment or interact or something. Yeah. That's cool. That's fun. Let's us know that there you're out there and you have thoughts about what we're doing. That's great. Um, and for next time, we're going to do 1995. John Carpenter right remake. There, yeah. of, I think it's 95. Okay. But um, maybe I'm wrong. I'm more wrong about dates than I am right. Anyways, John Carpenter's remake of Village of the Damned. It's Mark Hamill, Kirstie Alley, Christopher Reeve. Um, <laughs> it's supposed to be terrible. <laughs> we'll see. Um, this one I could not find. Uh, I'm always looking for the free, free know, version you know, like app have I have or whatever, but I can only find it. it to rent. So, yeah. but at least it's available. At least it's not one that is, isn't streaming anyway. Right. No, I'm willing to pony up a few bucks and see what we're doing here. So um, join us next time for that. And unless you have anything else to add. I, I think not. Then we will talk to you all next week. <laughs>